بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلوات الله وسلامه على نبينا الأمين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى إخواني today we're going to take some of the أحكام of رمضان and this is going to be the very last درس from the normal دروس that we gave before Ramadan إن شاء الله this will be the last درس the Sunday daras as well as the Tuesday daras will be suspended and then they will be the daras for the Ramadan season the month of Ramadan is a new program so it's only befitting that we deal with making the dhikr and the tadkir and the mudarisa of some of the ahkam and some of the questions that you may have about Ramadan but before doing that brother stopped me concerning an issue that he had put forth a while ago kind of connected with Ramadan in a roundabout way and his question was that how was the question? The hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam لا يدخل الشيطان بيت تقرأ فيه سورة البقرة The shaytan does not enter into the house in which Surah al-Baqarah is recited The understanding of that hadith is that if Surah al-Baqarah is recited it doesn't necessarily have to be all of the surah but if aspects of the surah were recited, then the shaitan will not have the ability to enter into that home. And what strengthens that point of view that you don't have to necessarily recite all of the surah in order to get the fadail of this particular hadith is the fact that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam in the famous hadith in Sayyid Bukhari Muslim and the authority of Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu when the shaitan came to him and he was trying to steal from the Baytul Mal and he taught Abu Huraira the greatest ayat of the Quran which was Ayatul Kursi which is in Surah Al-Baqarah the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to read Surah Al-Baqarah and he used to say Man qara'aha kafathu laylatuhu wa yawmahu anyone who reads this particular ayat by itself it will be enough for him he also told us sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam about the last two ayats of Surah Al-Baqarah Amin al-Rasulu bima unzila ilayhi min rabbihi To the end of the surah Man qara'ahuma kafatahu Anyone who reads these two last ayat They will be enough for him So if any aspects of Surah Al-Baqarah were recited in a person's home It is enough to prevail, to prevent the shaitan from coming into the home but obviously the more that's recited the better the more that's recited the better analyze a'la wa a'la concerning the issue of the ahkam of ramadan a few things we want to bring to your attention ikhwani then we open up the door for your questions inshallah if there are any questions in the way of making preparations for ramadan that we want to remind you first of all of this golden opportunity of the blessed month of Ramadan that has a number of virtues, so many of them, as the Prophet told us, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, as salawatu khams wal jumatu in al juma wa Ramadan in Ramadan, mukaffiratun lima bayna hunna in the chtuni batil kabair, when a person prays the five prayers every day. And when a person performs Salatul Juma to the next Juma, Ramadan to the next Ramadan, these are expiations of the sins of the person if he avoids the major sins. So the month of Ramadan is an opportunity for a person to wipe away the Sagha'ir and the Noob that he performed since the last Ramadan, and that shows the virtues, no doubt about it. In addition to that, the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Kullu amr ibn Adam lahu al-hasanatu bi-ashri amthaliha 
إلى سبعمية ضعفا إلا الصوم يقول الله تعالى إن الصوم لي وأنا أجزي به ترك شهوته وطعامه وشرابه لأجلي He said that all of the deeds that Bani Adam does those deeds are for him other people will look at him doing them other people know, knows that he's doing them and the good deeds will be rewarded in accordance to what the person does from 10 to 700 everything will be rewarded like that except the psalm and Allah said that the fasting is for me and I will reward the fasting the person he abandons his desires he abandons his food and his drink for me so I will take care of it so this is the one ibadah from the ibadat of Al-Islam that Allah Azza wa Jal takaffala bihi aw biha Allah is responsible for rewarding the individual for it in its totality man sama yawman fi sabilillahi ba'adallahu ta'ala bihi wajhuhu an nara jahannam sabayina kharifa anyone who fasts one day in the cause of Allah Ramadan other than Ramadan Allah will take his face 70 years 70 seasons away from the hellfire all of these are indications and examples of the virtues of As-Sawm Fi Sabilillah Ramadan and other than Ramadan so it is a golden opportunity again I want to emphasize about that hadith of Abu Huraira that Allah Ta'ala said As-Sawm li wa ana ajzi bi when a person gives fi sabilillah money, salat, whatever he does, he brings someone to the masjid, any and everything that he does, Allah Azza will reward him for what he did. And he'll give him a reward, and he'll make that reward, 10 rewards up to 700. So it has an adid, a number of rewards that he's going to get that is ma'loom, it's known from, seven, from 10 to 700. With the exception of fasting. When a person fasts, fi sabilillah, there is no known amount of times or numbers that Allah is going to reward that thing. Only the fasting is like that. Only the fasting like that. So we have a number of verses in the Quran and the authentic Sunnah that go to show us that when you do a good thing, Allah Azza wa Jal, He manifolds the reward for that particular thing. Like His statement, مَثُلُ الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ أَمْوَالَهُمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ كَمَثَلِ حَبَّةٍ أَنْبَتَتْ سَبَعَ سَنَابِ فِي كُلِّ سُنْبُلَةٍ مِئَةَ حَبَّةٍ يُضَائِفُ اللَّهُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ يُضَائِفُ اللَّهُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ وَاللَّهُ وَاسِعٌ عَلِيمٌ The example of the person who spends money in the cause of Allah is like the example of the grain of corn when you plant the one seed it sends out seven stalks and each one of those stalks are 100 other seeds so if you give one pound for sabilillah that pound you're going to be rewarded from 10 up to 700 pounds that's for every deed in al-islam with the exception of a song when a person fasts Allah gives them the reward without any hisab, without any hisab whatsoever. And that's from the clear virtues of fasting. Some of the ulama of Islam, they said, part of the meaning of this hadith is that when Allah Ta'ala looks into the things that people did, where they oppressed people and they wronged people, the mavalim, when Allah looks into the deeds of the people, someone oppressed another person, yawm al-qiyam, he has to get his haq. He may be put in a position where he's going to start taking from his salat. He takes from his zakat. He takes from his hajj, his umrah, his birru walidain. Those deeds that he did. But Allah Azza wa will not allow for his psalm to be taken from because the psalm is exclusively and totally and absolutely for Allah Azza wa It is the manifestation in the ibadat of Al-Islam where the person is doing something clearly and only for Allah. Because no one knows that you're fasting except Allah. Khayru salat al-mar salatu fi baytihi ila al-maktubah The best salat that a person can make is the salat that he makes in his house where no one can see him. Because he has ikhlas. It's between him and Allah. 
the only prayer that he should make in front of the people is the wajib prayer. And he should try to hide the rest of the prayers to make them in his house so that it doesn't make riya, it doesn't make shirk al ashar Al-Islam is opposed to a person falling to shirk in any shape, form, or fashion. But if a person has to pray his sunnahs and his nawafil in the masjid because it's easier, then he's allowed to do so. But in regards to the fasting, in regards to the fasting, it is the single ibadah from the ibadat of al-Islam. There's nothing else similar to it. Where if the person does it, no one knows that it's being done except Allah Azza wa and his slave, the sa'in. Only Allah and his slave. And Allah Ta'ala, he loves that the ibadah is done solely and strictly for him. All of those issues are from the virtues of fasting. So as we mentioned a number of times, we shouldn't look at this particular month as being a month which is a burden as it is a month that Allah Ta'ala has written for us and in it is our life. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمْ الْيُسُرْ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمْ الْعُسْرِ Allah wants for you ease. He wants to make for you, make things easy for you and He doesn't want to make things difficult for you. First thing we want to mention concerning the ahkam and reminding you of the importance of this thing and the people who are mutakasirun, mutahawinun in some of these issues that we're going to mention and that's why we specifically chose these things is the importance, ya ibadullah of making the tabyid before you go to bed before you go to bed that the people have to make a conscious effort of making the niyyah that he's going to fast tomorrow or for the duration of the month because that's what the Prophet ordered us to do Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He told us مَن لَمْ يُبَيِّتِ السُّيَامِ مِنَ اللَّيْلِ فَلَا سُيَامَ لَهُ The person who did not make his niyyah to fast in the night time then he doesn't have no fast tomorrow This is especially for the fast that is wajib like Ramadan or if a person made an oath if Allah delivers my child and my child has good health I'm going to fast tomorrow if a person does a fast that is wajib then before the day of that fast it is obligatory upon him to make his niyyah and the niyyah, the place of the niyyah is in the heart the niyyah is never said for any ibadah on the tongue in front of the people no way to an usalliya salatul juma wara hadhal imam muqtadiyan bihi ila akhirihi is kalamun farikh Already we're ajim, I'm an ajim person, I'm an ajim. When I became a Muslim, they used to give me a book I had to read how to memorize this dua of a niyyah. It's hard enough memorizing Surah Al-Fatiha in transliteration. Now they're going to put on top of me all of these dua and make me have to read those dua before I make salat. All of that, no dalil upon it. When the Prophet would pray sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, no one stood there and he said, Allahu Akbar. And then the person is sitting there saying, that's kalamun farikh. Kalamun farikh. Yes, he told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِنَّمَ الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ All of the deeds will be judged by your intention. And your intention is just as important as the action itself. It is half of your ibadah that you're going to do. But nonetheless, the niyyat, the place of it is in the heart. Even if a person is going to perform umrah or al-hajj, from the ahkam of performing an umrah and al-hajj, is the person makes the talbiyah, labbayka lahumma al-hajj, or labbayka lahumma umrah, that's not your niyyat, it's the talbiyah. And there's a difference between the two. So the important thing is that we understand that you have to make your niyyat the night before fasting. And the niyyah can be made one of two ways. The person can do it every single day, every single night, or he can do it at the beginning of the month. This is the month of Ramadan, and he has in his mind the niyyah that he's going to make and so forth and so on. The reason why this is important is because he used to wake up sometimes, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and it would be after Fajr time, he would go to one of the homes of his wives, and he would ask them, do you have any food? They would say, we don't have any food. He would say, then I'm fasting today. Then I'm fasting today. But that's the fast of the nawafil. So if a person in these days of Sha'ban, 
he realized he didn't eat all day since Fajr time and it's almost Maghrib, 15 minutes before Maghrib, 30 minutes before Maghrib. He didn't eat. He says, I didn't even eat today. Okay, my need, I'm fasting today. He'll get the reward of fasting on that particular day because the psalm that is from the sunnah or the nawafil, you don't have to make a niyyah as the Prophet shows sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the psalm that is wajib, it requires the niyyah. And that also goes for the days that you're making up. So if you're making up the fast from last Ramadan, the lady, the person traveled, he was sick, you didn't fast, you have to make the tabyid of the niyyah before the day either every day or at the beginning of the month both of those ways inshallah is permissible and no for surety and then come to the second point from what establishes a person niyat is the fact that he's going to take the suhoor he's going to take the suhoor the fact that he gets up early in the morning is a proof and an indication that his niyat is that he's going to fast similar to the wudu why does the man not have to stand behind the imam and say, I intend to pray Salat al-Dhuhr behind this imam as a follower? Why is that kalam fariq? It's kalam fariq because when he was in his house and he made wudu, that was part of his niyyah right there. He's not making wudu to want to cool himself down from the heat and the weather. He's making wudu to go to perform the salat. Similar to that is the suhoor, the suhoor. So that shows us one of the important aspects of the suhoor. So I remind you brothers of the importance of the suhoor. In addition, in addition to it helping to establish the person's niyyah, the importance of the suhoor is that the Prophet ordered it. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Inna ma'ashir al-anbiya umirna bithalatha. All of the Prophets were ordered to do three things. All of them, without any exception. And one of the things that they were ordered to do was the first thing he mentioned, ta'khir al suhoor that you should delay the suhoor, that you should take the suhoor. It is a part of the etiquette of fasting from the ahkam of fasting. So from that hadith and the ayat, kutiba alaykum siyamu kama kutiba ala ladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. Fasting has been prescribed upon you as it was prescribed upon those who went before you. We get an understanding that all of the people they fasted before us, all of them, and all of the prophets fast before us, and we also fast. And there are also indications in Khwani that they fasted in the blessed month of Ramadan. From the virtues of Ramadan is the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, unzilat suhufu Ibrahim. أول ليلة من شهر رمضان وأنزل أنزلت التوراة لست مضت من رمضان وأنزل الإنجيل لثلاث عشرة خلت من رمضان وأنزلت الزبور لثمان عشرة خلت من رمضان وأنزل القرآن لأربع وعشرين خلت من رمضان. From the virtues of Ramadan is that all of these five books have been revealed. The parchments of Ibrahim, they were revealed to Ibrahim, the Khalil of Allah, the first night of Ramadan. And the Injil, the Torah, the Torah was given to Musa after six days passed in Ramadan. And the Injil that Isa ibn Maryam was given, was given to him after 13 days passed in Ramadan. And the Zabur of Dawood was given to him 18 days after Ramadan began. And the Qur'an was given to me, the Prophet Wasallam, after 24 days had passed in Ramadan, which is a delil that the 25th is the day of Laylatul Qadr. That's one way of understanding the hadith. The 25th is Laylatul Qadr. And another way of understanding it is, it was revealed after the 24th, so it could have been the 25th, could have been the 27th, could have been the 29th. Allah is A'la and A'lam. So anyway, from the virtues of Ramadan, Ikhwani is that all of the prophets, they used to fast, and it appears that they used to fast in the month of Ramadan, and one of the reasons why we fast and they fasted in the month of Ramadan is because it is the month that the Qur'an was revealed. That's one of the reasons we fast in Ramadan. There are some months that are better than Ramadan, more sacred than Ramadan. Dhul Hijjah, Dhul Qi'dah, Rajab, Muharram, these are the four sacred months in Al-Islam. They are sacred months. Ramadan is not a sacred month. But Allah legislated the fasting for the Muslims in Ramadan. 
One of the reasons is because it's the month that all of those books were revealed. Shahu Ramadan al-Ladhi unzira fi al-Qur'an Hudan lil-Nas wa bayinatim min al-Huda wal-Furqan Faman shahida minkum al-Shahra fal-Yasum The month of Ramadan is the month in which the Qur'an was revealed as a guidance to mankind and the bayinat, the thing that makes clear for the people and guidance. So anyone who is there, you're present in your home during Ramadan, they fast. This fa, this fa, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ فَمَنْ شَهِدَ وَمَنْ شَهِدَ الشَّهْرُ فَمَنْ شَهِدَ وَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمْ الشَّهْرُ فَلْيَسُمْهُ فَلْيَسُمْهُ This fa is the fa as sababiyya Because you were here and it is Ramadan, then it should be a day that you fast. So the suhoor is from the etiquette. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be abandoned. He used to take and used to command the people to eat dates for the suhoor. He sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam used to tell the people to just drink water if you have it for the suhoor. But there's another important aspect of the suhoor that we want to bring to your attention. In many of the masajid, when you find the calendar, You'll find on the calendars of many of the masajid in this city, in this country, and across the globe that the people will stop fasting although there is still 15, 20, sometimes 30 minutes left before the actual adhan for fajr. Those calendars are an innovation and those calendars are ma'asiyah to Allah and those calendars are against the spirit of Ramadan and they are against the spirit of what the Prophet brought Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam The Prophet brought a religion And he came as Allah Ta'ala said in the Qur'an وَمَا أَرُسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةٍ لِلْعَالَمِينَ He came as a mercy He himself used to fast A number of days consecutively Without any suhoor And without breaking his fast The companions tried to follow him And he said don't do that إِنِّي أَنْهَاكُمْ مَنَ الْوُصَالِ I prohibit you from doing this. They said, but you do it, Ya Rasulullah. He said, Lestu kahayati ahadikum. I'm not like you. My Lord gives me food and drink. I'm a human being, but I'm stronger than all of you, and Allah nourishes me. I'm not like you in that regard. So he used to have rahmah on the people. And he used to tell the people, take your suhoor as close to the adhan as possible. As a rahmah. If you take your suhoor an hour before the adhan, that means you're going to get hungrier an hour before whenever you normally get hungry. So he used to tell the people to delay the suhoor in order for the person to enable himself to fast during the day without becoming hungry for the longest amount of time possible. He saw a man, and the man had the cup in his hand, and he heard the adhan and he put it down. The Prophet told the people, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sallam, Ida Sami Ahadakum al Nida Wal Ina fi Yadihi Fala Yadruhu Hatta Yakdi Ahajatahu. If one of you is drinking and then the adhan goes off and it is in your hand, then don't put it down until you finish. Don't put it down until you finish. He used to. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam teaches companions If the Salat of Al-Maghrib was going on And the food was down And the person was eating the food The companions would stay sitting down Comfortably eating the food They didn't stuff their faces Eat very very quickly to go to make the Salat They used to take their time So this goes to show from the Ahkam of Ramadan That that calendar that says you should stop and make the insak from the sihri as they call it you should stop 15 minutes, 30 minutes ihtiyatan as a precautionary measure this is an innovation in al-Islam don't do it at all but that's not to say that the person should put their food down 2-3 minutes before the adhan what happens in the month of Ramadan his wife is tired he himself is tired his condition, his dhuruf At some point he wakes up kind of late He didn't wake up 30 minutes before the adhan He woke up 
10 minutes before the event. She woke up seven minutes before the event. So she starts cooking the egg very quickly or the dates or whatever. And as a result of that one off, it happens. Sometimes they come and they go to sit down, take your time and you can eat. Take your time. But don't prepare a big massive meal and then eat the meal and say that the Prophet said, don't put the cup down. No, because now you'll be making a tahayul. A tahayul is what the Yahud did. The Tahud, the Yahud, they throw the nets out on Friday and the nets catch the fish all day Saturday. The Yahud come, they reel in the nets with all the fish. They say, we weren't fishing. We weren't fishing. And they play games like that. So if the person every day he comes and he says, you remember the hadith of the Prophet wasallam? If the adhan goes off and you hear it, don't stop eating. So you make the food two, three minutes before the adhan and you eat using that hadith. This is something where a person is playing around with his deen. The other thing that we want to mention to you brothers inshallah ta'ala is some of the things that are not permissible from the mahdhurat that we have to be careful about concerning the psalm of Ramadan. And there are a few things, not very many, but a few. One of them is that we should understand that the real fasting in Al-Islam is not the fasting where we just are not eating and we're not drinking. Those people who they don't eat and they don't drink that which is halal. They refrain from eating and drinking that which is halal. And then they partake in eating and drinking, eating what's haram, like the flesh of people, making ghiba, qila, waqal, allagu, arraf, and they're doing all kinds of things with the lisan. Those people didn't understand the reality of the fast. The Nabi Abu Qasim and Mustafa al Amin. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He told the people لَيْسَ الصِّيَامِ أَنَ الْأَكْلِ وَالشُرُبْ وَإِنَّمَ الصِّيَامِ أَنَ الْلَغْوِ وَالرَّفْضِ Fasting is not for you to just abandon your food and the drink But fasting is also for you to abandon vain speech And lewd speech and behavior So if you want a successful Ramadan Then you have to make jihad in this month If you want a successful Ramadan you have to make jihad this month and you have to kill, you have to literally kill the TV. You have to kill the internet. Unless you're going to use the internet to listen to the book of Allah, to listen to those places where you can hear the dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the way people waste time with reading issues and communicating on social networks and wasting time and so forth and so on, this will kill your Ramadan. Your Ramadan will be a cultural Ramadan. The Soma Tuqlidi. Prophet told the people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Rubba, Sa'im, Laysa Lahu Min, Aw Hadduhu Min Sawmihi, Al Ju'r Wal Atash. It may be that a person fast. And the only thing that he gets out of his Soma is he made himself hungry and he made himself thirsty. But when it comes to the real reason why Soma was legislated, he is ba'id jiddin from that reality. Like the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, مَن لَمْ يَدْعَ قَوْلَ الزُّورِ وَالْعَمَلَ بِهِ فَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ حَاجَّةٌ فِي أَنْ يَدْعَ الطَّعَامُ وَالشَّرَابُهُ The person who does not abandon making false speech, false accusation, الزُّور, قَوْلَ الزُّور, lying and so forth and so on, Allah doesn't have any need for that individual to leave alone his food and his drink. So we have to get our heads around the spirit of Ramadan. The TV, mushkila. The internet, mushkila. Being around ashab, people who give you a lot of kalam fari, mushkila. Those people who give you qila wa qal, he said that, she said this, he did that. Wayne Rooney, he went over there. Manchester United, they did that and that. You have to avoid those people in the month of Ramadan. salama. You see those kind of people? Salam alaikum. You have to cut those people off because they will cut into your Ramadan if you're trying to make a good fast. If you're trying to make a good fast. He comes, he's your friend, but he's coming to you and he's really a shaitan and he says to you, you know, I'm tired, turn away. Let's go home. We can make Qiyamul Layl 
And Qiyam al-Layl is more rewarding because it's between you and Allah. You know, praying by yourself is better. But the reality of it is, you're not going to make Qiyam al-Layl. The reality of it is, when you go home, you're going to watch TV, you're going to sit around, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. So these things are from the mahdhurat. From the biggest mahdhurat, from the biggest things to avoid, is the practice that we find prevalent, people who fast and they don't pray. People who don't fast, who fast and they don't pray. That insan is miskeen, 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 miskeen. You feel sorry for him. You have to have shafaqa for the person who doesn't pray and they fast. Prayer is more important than the salat. And just as a person will pray and he doesn't take care of the siyam, it's possible that he can also fast and doesn't take care of the siyam. Qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam inna raju wa yansaraf min salatihi wa ma kutiba lahu minha illa ashruha aw tis'uha aw thamanuha aw sab'uha aw sudusuha aw khamsuha aw rubu'uha aw thurufuha aw nusfuha A person may make the salat and after he makes salat in maghrib he gets up and he goes and he leaves that maghrib all he got from that maghrib was 10% 20%, 30%, depending upon where his mind was. He came to the masjid, and before coming to the masjid, he had an argument with his missus, he had an argument with someone, his mother, his father, something happened, he gets in the line, and his mind is flying in the sky with the pigeons. His mind is back at home. His mind is somewhere. Did I turn the keys off? Did I bring the keys? Is the light off? After that salat, he finishes the prayer and his reward of the salat is sifr, nothing. If that's the case with the salat, the same holds true with the psalm, with the psalm. So the person who does not pray, wallahi tallahi wa billahi, he doesn't have any psalm. The Prophet told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man taraka salat al-asr, habita amaluhu. Anyone who leaves and abandons the asr prayer, he doesn't have any salat. He doesn't have any salah. What about the one or the one who abandons asr prayer? It will render his deeds null and void. If he doesn't pray asr, his deeds will be made to be zero, nothing. What if the person abandoned dhuhr and he abandoned fajr before that? He abandoned isha before that, al maghrib before that, and that's just the way he is. He doesn't come to juma. He fasts the whole month of Ramadan and the only prayer he makes in Ramadan is the Salat of al Eid or the Fajr or, or the Maghrib or the, or the Maghrib prayer because there's food in the masjid or the people are going to eat in his family. That's not the Siyam of Ramadan. That's one of the things that should be avoided. If we have people who are around us, we have to advise them. From the Mahdhurat, from what should be avoided is forcing yourself to vomit. If you force yourself to vomit in the month of Ramadan when you're fasting, forced vomit breaks your fast. As for the vomit that comes involuntarily, then you vomit, continue to fast, no problem. And that's due to the authentic hadith, مَنْ ذَرْعَهُ الْقَيْءِ فَلَا قَضَاءَ عَلَيْهِ وَمَنْ اسْتَقَاءَ فَلْيَقْضِ the person who was overcome with vomit and he vomits, then he doesn't have to make that day up. But the person who compels himself and he forces himself to vomit, then this individual, he has to make the day up. What is not from the things that are mahdurat, but many people think that they are, but they're not, is that in the month of Ramadan, it is permissible for a person to brush his teeth, it is permissible for a person to swallow spit, even if it is that snuts, you know, the mucus spit. If he swallows it, it doesn't break his fast, although it's better for him to spit that out, but it doesn't break his fast. The Prophet told us وسلم, that if he wasn't afraid that it would be difficult upon us, he would have ordered the people to use the miswak for every prayer, and he didn't say every prayer except the prayers of Ramadan. That would have been every prayer including Ramadan. The only reason why he told us or he didn't tell us to use the miswak for every prayer 
is because it would have been difficult. <coughs> right now in this masjid, if I ask you people, how many of you people have a miswak? Who has a miswak here? Because it's hard to keep up with those miswaks, no matter how much you try. In the month of Ramadan, I challenge you, inshallah, do this sunnah, do this sunnah of keeping up the miswak. After two days, you'll lose the miswak. After three days, you're going to lose the miswak. Even the person who's really trying to hold on to this. So he told the people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he was afraid that we wouldn't be able to do it. If he told you to do it, it's wajib, you have to do it. Most people are not going to be able to do it because we can't keep up with that stick. We can't keep up with it, although it has a lot of benefits. So the shahid from that kalam is, he commanded us, encouraged us to use the miswak for those who have the ability, and you can use the miswak in Ramadan and outside of Ramadan. So the miswak has a taste to it, it has residue to the wood, and it doesn't break your fast. And if it did happen when you use the miswak and it went down your throat, it doesn't break your fast. No one is using the miswak to eat wood. No one. It doesn't break your fast. Smelling bukhur, smoke, perfume, doesn't break your fast. Doesn't break your fast. It's permissible for the lady to taste the food. Anyone who's cooking you can taste the food. But again, don't swallow it. Taste it, spit it out, don't swallow it. This is all permissible in the deen. You can use toothpaste, but it's better not to use toothpaste because the smell of the fasting person's breath is more beloved to Allah Ta'ala than the misk. From what is not from the mahdhurat, and people think it is, is if a person wakes up and he has janaba. He wakes up after having relationships the previous night with his wife. He wakes up or she wakes up after having relationships with the husband. The person had a nocturnal dream. They had an ihtilam and they woke up junub. That doesn't mean that you can't fast. We gave a class here a few weeks ago about how the companions used to take a position that was wrong. And if someone brought them the truth, then the companions would reject their position and then support the truth. And we told you about that companion Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu. I believe it was Abu Huraira who was telling the people, it was Abu Huraira who was telling the people, if you wake up Junub, then you can't fast. And then two of the tabi'een went to Aisha and they went to Umm Salama. And they said, Abu Huraira is saying this and saying that. That if a person wakes up and he's Junub, he has Janab, he can't fast. Aisha radiallahu anha said, Wallahi, he made a mistake. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will wake up Junab and he will fast. Umm Salama said the same thing. When they came and they told Abu Huraira that, Abu Huraira said, I never heard the Prophet say what I was saying. I just heard Fadl ibn Abbas said that. So I'm just telling the people. I didn't say the Prophet said that. Fadl ibn Abbas told me and I was just telling the students that. But now that you people are telling me, Aisha and Umm Salama said that the Prophet woke up Junab, then the truth is with them. So the Messenger of Allah will wake up with Janaba and he will continue to fast. So some people believe if they wake up with Janaba, they can't fast. And this is not the case. Before I forget, I have to mention this, Ikhwani, although it's not in the order, but it came to my mind, I'm afraid I may forget it. If a person makes a mistake in Ramadan and he does something to break his fast, should he not fast for the remainder of the day, although he destroyed that fast, and he's in trouble? He has to fix it up now. But that day has been destroyed. Should he continue to fast, or should he just say, no, I'm not fasting because it's broken anyway? The ulama of Islam, they said, because of the hurma of the day, because of the hurma of the day, it's a sacred day, then the person should not eat. Although he broke the rules, and that day is against him, he still shouldn't eat, especially in public. Because this is a sign that the person has no deen. So waking up with Janaba Khwani does not break your fast. You just make the ghusl, and then after making the ghusl, you go ahead and you complete your fast. In addition to that, the issue of gargling one's mouth, the madmada, the madmada. When the Prophet commanded the people to make the correct dua, the correct wudu, part of what he said was, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, wa baalik fil wudu, 
أو وبالك في استنشاق إلا أن تكون صائمة When you make wudu, make a good wudu And when you do your nose, the istinshaq Put a lot of water Normally when you make wudu Put a lot of water or get enough water And make sure you get it up to your nose Get it in there and blow it out Except if you're fasting, he said Except if you're fasting So when you're fasting and you put the water in your nose You shouldn't bring it up a lot like you normally do Maybe just get it in the tip of the nose and blow it out. But if the water accidentally went down the khayshum of a person, it doesn't break as fast. Again, because no one in his right mind is going to try to get nourished by drinking water through his nose. No one's going to do that. Although the kofar who go to parties and hang out and they drink and they go to clubs, they drink vodka through their noses. That's what they do now. The princes of this country, that's what they do. They take shots of vodka, akramakumullah, and they drink it through their nose as a way of having mubalagha and just partying and being wild and wilding out. The issue of kissing a person's wife also has to be mentioned because it's from the ahkam of the Ramadan. Our Nabi and our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to kiss his wife and show affection to his wife, Aisha. And then he would go out and make salat while he was fasting. But Aisha used to tell the young men, don't do it. They would say, but the Prophet did it. Even you said he did it. And she would tell the people, no kana amlaku li irbihi minkum. He used to control his desires better than all of you. An older man came and said, Ya Rasulullah, I kissed my wife. He said, is there any problem with that? He said, no, it's no problem. No problem. It doesn't break your fast. Then a young man came and said, Ya Rasulullah, what about me? Can I kiss my wife? He said, you, don't kiss your wife. You, don't kiss your wife. And he said, why? You said that to the old man and you said that to this other man. He said, because the sheikh, the sheikh, he is amlak, he has more power over his desires than the young person. And for this reason, Ikhwani, the scholars of Islam used to dislike for people to get married in the month of Ramadan. Don't get married in the month of Ramadan. If you get married in the month of Ramadan, there can be problems. There can be problems. And the person who comes close to the hima, Yushiku and Yaqafi. The king, the king, he has an area. That's the grass of the king. Don't let your animals go close to the grass. You gotta hold your animals far, far back. The Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam, the one who allows his animal to graze close to the grass of the king, sooner or later the animal is going to walk in that area. So in the month of Ramadan, Stay far, far away from this area altogether. Just don't get married in this month. Set the wedding for another month because if the person were to get married in the month of Ramadan, there can be potential problems. In addition to what has proceeded from the ahkam of the Ramadan al-Mubarak is the issue of the iftar, the futur, and breaking the fast. We told you that he said all the prophets were commanded to do three things. One of them was to delay the suhoor in the morning. The second one was to be quick in breaking the fast. Have the iftar. Quick. So once the adhan goes off, you start eating. Don't make dua. Don't make salat. Don't do anything. As soon as the adhan goes off, you eat, and that's it. And then after that, you make salat, you make dua. Some of the people, they know that the dua of the sa'im is accepted, so the mu'adhan is making the adhan, and the individual is making dua. This is against the sunnah. And this is not what Allah wants from you at this particular time. The best ibadah at this particular time is to break your fast. And the best thing to break your fast with are the dates. The barakah of the Tamar or the Timur as Sumadi say. So you break your fast with dates. If you don't have dates, then with water. You don't have water, 
that you can break your fast with anything. Concerning the breaking of the fast, Ikhwani, few things about the iftar, a lot of things concerning the iftar, but we'll leave that. If it comes up during the Q&A session, inshallah, we'll deal with it. But the ahkam of the iftar are important, like learning the dua right now. Learning the dua right now. He said specific things, so take the time out right now to say it if you know it in Arabic, alhamdulillah, fabihi wa ni'mah. If you don't know it in Arabic, then you can say the thirst has gone away and our veins have become moist and the reward has been established by the permission of Allah. ذَهَبَ الذَّمَأُ وَابْتَلَّتِ الْأُرُوقُ وَثَبَتَ الْأَجْرُ InshaAllah. How the Muslim all this time and he didn't memorize the dua of fasting yet. Take advantage of these last few days. Three lines, three simple lines he can learn. He starts Salat al Fajr, learn the first line. Dhahaba al Dhamu. Then at Dhuha time, Wabtul al Uruq. And then at Maghrib time, Wa Thabat al Ajru. Insha'Allah. And then after Isha, he just goes over, he goes over, he goes over, and he puts them all together and he has it before Ramadan. Before Ramadan. As for those other du'as, Allahumma laka sumt wa rizqika aftart, then this is not authentic. It's better to avoid it and just to stick with the sunnah of the Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Last thing we want to mention, Ikhwani, is as the ayah said, we mentioned, Yuridu Allahu bikum al yusr wa la yuridu bikum al usr. Allah wants to make things easy for you, He doesn't want to make things difficult for you. In the month of Ramadan, if you're traveling, you don't have to fast if you don't want to fast. Laysa. Min al bir as siyam of his safar. That's what he said. Laysa min al bir as siyam of his safar. It is not righteousness that you fast while you're traveling. He said, whoever wants to fast while they travel, let him fast. Whoever doesn't want to fast, let him break his fast. One day, as Ali Imam al-Bukhari narrated, it was so hot, the companions had their hands on their heads. It was so hot. Blocking the sun, the sun out and wiping the sweat off. All of them. They said, no one fasted in the month of Ramadan. No one. And we were fasting except Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abdullah ibn Rawaha. Abu Abdullah, you with us? No one fasted except Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abdullah ibn Rawaha. Abu Bakr no, Umar no, Uthman no, Ali no, Ukasha no. Just the Prophet and one other companion. And when others used to fast, the ones who were fasting didn't blame the ones who broke their fast, and the one who broke their fast didn't blame the ones who were fasting. It's upon the person. Better than Sanwar and Nafsihi Basir. You do it what you are easy and comfortable with when you're fasting. So they were traveling, it was very hot, and there were some people, they were fasting, they fell out, they lost consciousness. Not one of them, a number of them, they were tired. They couldn't move. So the people went, and the Prophet saw a, gather, a crowd gathered around them. He said, what's the deal? What's up with those people? What's happening? They said, Ya Rasulullah, the people were fasting, they fell out. They need to get water, they need the people to fan them. He told the people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, ذَهَبَ الْمُفْتِرُونَ بِالْأَجُورِ Those people who broke their fast, those people who were not fasting, they took all of the reward today. The fasters, they didn't take the reward. Allah doesn't want you to fast and fall out. He doesn't want from my father-in-law, from your father-in-law. He doesn't want from my auntie and from your auntie. He doesn't want the person who has arthritis, and all kind of other medical issues to fast and get sick. Allah doesn't want that. He wants you to take advantage of the ruksa. Inna Allah yuhibbu an tu'ta ruksuhu kama yakrahu an tu'ta ma'asiyatu. So he loves it when you take advantage of the ruksa. So those are some of the ahkam that come to my mind, khwani, for the month of Ramadan that we want to remind you on. Of stay on top of the suhoor throughout the course of the month. Try not to eat so much.
if you can delay eating after Salatul Taraweeh, you'll get through the Taraweeh throughout the month, inshallah. But if you eat after Maghrib and you eat a lot after Maghrib, a Taraweeh is going to become a trial for you. It's going to become a trial for you. So, if you brothers have any questions, inshallah, concerning Ramadan and the ahkam of Ramadan, you can put your questions forward now, inshallah. Hal indukum shay? Akhi Umar. For the lady who was pregnant or the lady who was breastfeeding, there is ikhtilaf between the scholars. I don't like saying to people there's ikhtilaf and just confusing the people. So what? There's ikhtilaf. We respect that there's ikhtilaf. What we need to do is, what's the final opinion? The best position, inshallah, is the position of the companions, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Umar, Anas ibn Malik, when their wives, when their slave girls became pregnant and Ramadan came, if they were breastfeeding or they became pregnant, they used to tell them, don't fast and feed a person for each day you missed. Those people have the ability when you don't fast for some reason, a legitimate reason, you're not fasting. Those of you who have the ability, then you have to do a kafara, you have to do a fidya. And that fidya is to pay and feed one poor person for one day. That's what they commanded them to do. As for making it up, the delil is not clearly showing that. The delil is not clearly showing that. So it appears it's the strongest and the safest position, the position that is in harmony with the ease of fasting and the rahmah of Allah and the maqasid of the religion, the goals and the objectives of the deen is that she doesn't fast and all she does is pay. As for fasting or as for paying and making up, there's no delil for that. Fasting and paying as if she's a mujrima, she's a criminal, she made a mistake. There are delils that would suggest she can make it up because she missed days, she should make it up. But the companions didn't understand it like that. The command, companions understood that those women are exempt. They're exempt. And Allah knows best. Akhuna Asqar. Alaykum Cup in, blood. Khwani cup in at the beginning, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, he said, the person who takes blood out and he's fasting, then let him make it up for Ramadan. That was abrogated. Naskh. It became mensukh. Abrogated. So we know that an abrogation is part of our religion. Some people from the people of Al Ahwa, from the Mu'tazila and the Rafida, they don't even believe that anything can be abrogated. They said, how can something be abrogated? That's playing with the religion. Allah legislates something and then you abrogate it. Allah does what He wants to do. What are you talking about? And that's one of the issues that was abrogated. وَمَا نَنْسَخْ مِنْ آيَةٍ أَوْ نُنْسِيهَا نَأْتِ بِخَيْرٍ مِنْهَا أَلَمْ تَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ we don't cause an ayah to be abrogated or to be forgotten except that we bring an ayah that is better within or similar. Don't you know that Allah is able to do whatever He wants to do? يَمْحُ اللَّهُ مَا يَشَاءُ وَيُثْبِتْ وَعِنْدُهُ أُمْرُ الْكِتَابِ Allah wipes away whatever He wants to wipe away. He'll wipe a people away if He wants to do that. He'll wipe a person's sins away if He wants to do that. He wipes a person's good deeds away if He wants to do that. If it was written that you're going to die at 50 or 60, if Allah wants to wipe that away and you die at 70, 80, this is whatever He wants to do. And the umul kitab is with Allah. So abrogation is from the deen. Abrogation is from the deen. The Quran abrogates the Quran. The Quran abrogates the sunnah. 
the sunnah abrogates the Qur'an, the sunnah abrogates the sunnah. No doubt about that. So the sunnah abrogated the sunnah in this event, in that at the beginning, he used to say, if you make hijama, then you have to make up the fast. But then later on, he himself made hijama while he was fasting, and he didn't make it up, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. He said at the beginning, the person who makes hijama, he has to make it up. And then he himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, took that ruling off, and Allah knows best. From that ruling, ikhwani, also, if a person goes to the hospital, and in the ma'mal, the fahs, in the, in the, in the, in the laboratory, you guys say laboratory, in the laboratory, if they take from you blood to see if you have malaria or something, you, whatever, and they take blood, you donate blood, that does not invalidate a person's fast. So the hijama doesn't stop the fast in Allah knows best. Any more questions, Akhwani? Akhi jingir. Akhub salam. Concerning Akhi, the schools, I thought school, this is the holiday. Who's in school right now? What are you in summer school? Special ed people? I thought school was out right now. <laughs> if the child is in school, he should try to fast. If he, can, if he can handle it, let him handle it. If he can't handle it, and he's not at the age where fasting is an obligation upon him, then... He doesn't have the fats. But if he's a teenager, 18, 19, he's in university, whatever, he has to complete his fast. He's in summer school, he should complete his fast if the fasting is wajib upon him. As for a person who suffers from bleeding gums, then you should not agitate the problem and cause it to exasperate. You shouldn't do that. But if blood is in your mouth and you swallow it, it doesn't break your fast. Because the rule of fasting, Ikhwani, when something goes in, in order for it to break your fast, is that it is something that nourishes you. It's something that you're taking for nourishment. Like the smoking patch. It doesn't break your fast. Although that thing, whatever it released, those chemicals that are released, they go inside your body. But you're not using that to get nourished. So it doesn't break your fast. But if you take a some kind of needle injection in order to become um, nourished, to become hydrated. You take some insulin or something like that and it's going in and you get strength from it, then that makes your fast null and void. Renders your fast null and void. Allahu A'lam. Any more questions, Akhwani? Fadl Samba. Samba Fankamba. Gambia. Send the month of Ramadan, Al Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam did not gather the people up in the month of Ramadan in order to pray with them what we know as Taraweeh prayer. That didn't happen. But he did pray in the Jama'at with the people during the night time, which allows us to pray the Salat of the night time in congregation. 
And the general rule that we always tell people is whatever you do in the wajib prayer is the same thing that you do in the sunnah prayer unless a delil comes to make a distinction. So in regards to this particular prayer, we pray the salat that's wajib in jama'at and we can pray the salat that's the sunnah in jama'at because we have delil for that. We have delil for that, that it can be done in certain ways. And one of those prayers of the nawafa that can be done is the taraweeh prayer. In addition to that, the fact that Umar did it, radiyallahu anhu, he didn't do it because it was a new ruling altogether. He did it because it had never been done where the people had been gathered up like that particular way and he prevented them from being divided in the masjid. Three praying over here, seven over there, two over there, one over there. He put them all together and made two separate jamaats with them and he said this is a good innovation. When the companions saw what happened, they remained silent. The fact that they remain silent to what Umar did is ijma. So it in itself is a delil. Plus the Prophet told us, Alaykum is sunnati was sunnat al khulafa al rashidin mahdim and ba'di. Take my sunnah and sunnah of the khulafa al rashidin after me. The lady came and said, Ya Rasulullah, what happens if I don't find you? If you're dead, I have issues to ask someone in my deen. What should I do? He told her, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Iqtadi Billadini Min Ba'di Then you should follow the two people who come after me Abu Bakr and Umar So the fact that the companions all agreed to it Shows that it is a delil in the deen It is a delil in the deen And that's why we stressed and we emphasized Ikhwani about the issue of the Nasr The Nasr The abrogated issue the Qur'an abrogates the Qur'an, the Qur'an abrogates the Sunnah, the Sunnah abrogates the Qur'an, the Sunnah abrogates the Sunnah. But the ijma of the companions or the ulama can't abrogate anything. Qiyas can't abrogate anything. Istihsan can't abrogate anything. These things can only be abrogated by the two sources that are divinely revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So innovations are innovations and there are no good innovations in the deen. What I meant by good innovation is that the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did not do this particular thing this way. But there was a precedence in that he prayed with the people one night, then he prayed with them the second night, and then the third night they all gathered a lot of people and didn't come. The morning after he said, I was afraid it would become wajib upon you and then you wouldn't be able to do it. So it showed that they prayed the night prayer in Jama'at. So you can do it in Ramadan. No problem. And Allah knows best. Any more questions? Akhwani fi Allahi. In the book by Imam Ibn Abdul Bar, Ibn Abdul Bar. He wrote a book called Kitab al-Tamheed Which is the explanation of the Muwatta of an Imam Malik He brought some of the statements of the Tabi'een And the people of the past Who they would eat a full meal And then they would pray As long as the Salat time was still in But what is the general rule and practice of the Muslims across the globe is to break your fast with something khafif, light, and then eat the proper meal. But if a person wanted to eat the full meal, it's permissible. No one can say to him that it's haram. As Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, Thumma atimu siyam ila layl. Complete the fast until the night time comes. Once Maghrib comes, you're allowed to eat. You can eat a date in water, which is the sunnah to eat a date, or you can eat the full meal. And then after full meal, as long as the slot time is in, you get up and you pray. You get up and you pray. No one can come and say, that's haram, that's haram. And that happened to me one time with some people in America. The people used to eat the full meal. They were African Americans. They were they didn't have a lot of knowledge about the religion. They were new to Islam. They were just barely out of the nation of Islam. And they used to eat the full meal. 
And because one of our brothers didn't have any knowledge, he was telling them it's haram, you don't have any fast, you people are in the stray, and so forth and so on. You know, you're going overboard. The people, some people used to do that. So it is permissible. Akhi Umar. Try to get, if a person is at home, he doesn't have the ability to hear the adhan, how does he stop eating? The same way that he figures, I have to get to the masjid for fajr outside of Ramadan, and that's because we go by the calendar. But you have to make sure that the calendar is a calendar that is on point. Some of these calendars are off. They're off. So we have to do a better job with these calendars. And if it's clear the calendar is off, then you have to avoid it. In my local masjid, the Jamaat Tablif people pray, Bangladeshi people, in the masjid of Shah Jalal. Do you people know Shah Jalal? In their masjid, they pray doing the ghilis, Salat al-Fajr. And this five is 525. And they say that the Fajr comes in at 545. No man, it's Fajr time at that time. It's clearly Fajr time at that time. And you don't have to go on top of a building to see that. It's Fajr time. So you wouldn't practice and you wouldn't follow their calendar for Maghrib or for Fajr if that sun is up or it has set already. You won't follow what they're doing. And Allah knows best. I think Green Lane's calendar is on point for the most part. But we shouldn't take it, take it for granted. In the month of Ramadan, we should make sure we look at it. And if there is a problem, we should bring it to the attention of the people and say, hey, we think that there's a problem here. Any more questions? Okay then. We hope to see you guys the first day of Ramadan. I think it's going to start Tuesday and Wednesday. Or is it Wednesday or Thursday? Inshallah, we'll see you and you can look at our internet email to see the um, 